We always try to make the title of these slides dramatic so that people will click on them, but I think that this is probably a fair statement. Both unstructured and structured data have exploded in recent years, and there's a number of reasons for that. And today we're going to talk about the big data thesis and one component of that. Here you can see a chart. This is by IDC. It's quite popular. It shows the exponential growth of data. And that's because the, everything that we do, everybody's carrying around smartphones now. There's a lot of IoT sensors. You've got all kinds of applications on the internet that are producing data. There's just a ton of data being created. And the cool thing about that, or what's let's say what's appealing from an investor's perspective is that all this data can be now fed to AI algorithms and then they can produce insights. And there's a lot of hype surrounding AI and a lot of false claims. And we've debunked a fair number of firms over the years that claim to be using AI, but aren't really doing anything cool with it. But when you look at some of the big success stories, and one of those is quite recent. So I think it was, well, it says here 18 months ago when they first announced that DeepMind's protein folding AI algorithm was able to predict uh, how a protein folded based on the sequences of amino acids. Well, just recently they announced that it's been able to predict the structure of nearly all proteins known to science. So in just 18 months, it was able to do that, something that um, would have previously been thought to be impossible, and it's one of biology's biggest problems. They're already making breakthroughs based on the information that's produced. And perhaps what's most exciting, look at this chart here. So this, I took this from a TED talk one time, and I just find it to be fascinating. You see this little matrix, right? It's a matrix of beige squares. And in the upper left there, you see there's a little gray square. That's all the proteins we know about. Well, if you take amino acids and you sequence them, there's, you know, I don't know, probably trillions of ways that you can sequence them. Those are all the possible proteins that don't exist in nature that are represented by these beige squares. Think about all the cool things that we can produce. And essentially, it's a license to do all kinds of things that you can imagine in all sorts of uh, industries and applications. And what was interesting about this, I think Elon Musk was talking about how the one thing that might be able to bring together divided America would be uh, focus on a common goal. So they say that when there was uh, the 9-11 happened, that was uh, a point in time when Americans were more united than ever. Well, the day that this was announced, probably one of mankind's greatest accomplishments to date, I took a look over at CNN and there wasn't a single thing about it. And you can see here, I've highlighted in yellow, everything political at the CNN Wankathon that they wanna talk about. And of course, there are other news organizations that um, cater to whatever political party that you decide to ally yourself with. And it's just a real shame. I did an even further search because I couldn't believe it. Not a single article was ever published by CNN on this great event and i'm sure that i could go to other political news sites and and find the same results it's really sad and until um well, americans get behind a common cause like the sciences then we'll continue to, to be divided and focus on what doesn't matter but that's a little bit off track what today we're going to talk about is the potential of data to uh, enable AI algorithms to do cool things like figure out how proteins fold. Now, when we look at the data thesis, we started quite simple. Well, we want pick and shovels. Well, what would those be? For example, hard drives, and we did a piece on that. And then when you think about how data is stored, well, data is stored in databases. And these have been around for a long time. This acronym here stands for Relational Database Management System. It's been serving up data since 1970. And here is a schema. Each of these is a table. And in a table, you see fields that are defined and you have keys and they're all linked. It's pretty interesting stuff, actually. And databases are simply software platforms that store data. And they've been around for as long as I can remember. And certainly, I spent half my career working on these things. And um, when it comes to leaders in this space, 
There's a couple charts here that are interesting. The one on the left shows the growth of cloud databases. So data that's stored in the cloud versus on-premise, right? That's where a firm would host their own database servers. And on the right here, you can see the share of each primary vendor. So it's obvious that as of last year, Microsoft, Amazon, and Oracle constituted somewhere around 67% of market share. And you can see, unfortunately, IBM dwindling away there. Who knows why they can't get their act together? They never have been able to. But um, these are the primary vendors when it comes to relational databases. And we look at the size of the market, it's pretty decent size there. So this year, it's somewhere around $34 billion. And you'll get different estimates. This is excluding data warehousing. Um, but that's a decent size. And there's certainly the um, possibility of these large companies being displaced. But what we're going to talk about today is a different type of data. So those relational databases, they store structured data. And that makes sense. We looked at a schema, everything structured, labeled, defined. A phone number has to exist in this way. An email address has to have an at in it. Uh, a person's name can't exceed a certain number of characters. These are all um, metadata that are used to describe data. Well, when it comes to unstructured data, it can't be stored in a relational database. For example, you have images or video or audio or emails, texts, social media posts, things like that. 80 to 90% of data today is unstructured and 90% of it was created in the past several years. You hear that uh, statistic quoted quite a bit. Uh, it seems like that's uh, always the case and perhaps it is, but another way to think about unstructured data is it's everything that isn't structured data. So that's a, that's a better way to think about it. So 10% of unstructured data is stored and less than that is analyzed. And while structured data is growing by around 12% a year, unstructured is growing at a rate of 55 to 65% annually. So it's gonna become an increasingly large chunk of the overall data set. And it's being driven by emerging trends like social media, smartphones, geospatial imaging, IoT sensors, and the like. And it's not necessarily cannibalizing relational databases. That's important. So um, there's some blue ocean element to it, meaning you may not be able to do what you want with a relational database, but if you move to a unstructured data database platform, you may be able to do things that you can't do with those other big vendors. So what are the sorts of things that people might want to store that are unstructured data? Well, we have some examples here, text files, emails, social media, and then machine generated satellite imagery, digital surveillance sensor data, and I'll put a little use case here. So these, uh, this list of examples is from this firm, Datamation. It's a pretty decent list. But imagine what sort of customer insights you might be able to derive from mining call center transcripts, social media posts, product reviews, and chatbot conversations as they're being generated. Imagine how quickly you could identify problems that were arising in the field if you were um, wanting to see how your consumers were reacting to a new product release or anything like that. So unstructured data, there's a ton of insights. It's exactly the sort of stuff that AI algorithms would be able to analyze because anybody that's worked with databases before knows uh, structured query language and how to manipulate data understands how how important it is for data to be structured in order to analyze it. Well, AI algorithms don't need that structure. And that's why a lot of this unstructured data can be super valuable to companies. So when we look at the difference between the two, this is a decent chart from a firm. And the article that we've published that accompanies this video, all of this stuff is linked with appropriate credits. And you can, uh, I'll put a, or a link to that piece in the description of this video, but um, here you can see structured data compared to unstructured data. And the uh, second uh, set of information there where it says resides in. So structured data, as we said, relational databases, data warehouses. Is on the right, it says unstructured data, applications, no SQL databases. We're going to talk about that today. Data warehouses and data lakes. We've talked about those before in the context of 
uh, I believe, data robot. And I'll put a link to um, an article about data lakes in the description of this video as well. So they've provided some examples here. And we're going to talk a little bit more about NoSQL. So this actually stands for not only SQL. And there's a, a bit of a branding issue here. If you work in the database world, SQL is, uh, you pretty much live and breathe SQL. And this label NoSQL kind of seems like a threat to people's livelihoods, but it actually stands for uh, not only SQL. And it's a entire uh, different paradigm for databases. So I'm not going to get into the technical details here. And anybody who's interested in that can dive into the material out there. Uh, it's somewhat complicated. You'll probably need to have some background. I have some background and I would need you know, some serious time to dig in to truly understand um, how this differs and in, in the way that it's structured and organized based on my knowledge of relational databases. But uh, here are the important points. So most estimates, and there are a lot out there, say that this is going to reach a $25 billion market by 2027. So let's say it's somewhere in the two to five billion dollar range now it's going to grow at 30 percent compound annual growth rate all the estimates we saw are saying that it's just just growing as fast as you can imagine and the adoption of no sql databases this is quite important has primarily been driven by uptake from developers who find it easier to create various types of applications compared to using relational databases if you've worked as a developer you understand how complex things can be. So you usually have your relational database, then you maybe have a layer there with sprocks or stored procedures that you then would call and they're built as functions. And then you can um, access the database that way. And if somebody wants to change a field, it breaks everything. It's, developing software is incredibly complex. Well, NoSQL reduces complexity and it allows developers access to the data in a way that is much simpler. So the advantages include high scalability, distributed computing, key, lower cost, schema flexibility. Imagine being able to add or subtract uh, fields in a database on the fly without breaking the application. Things like that would be remarkable to be able to do. And of course, unstructured data and semi-structured data and no complex relationships. So it's a whole lot easier to use companies are adopting it left and right. It's not necessarily cannibalizing traditional vendors of relational database management systems, although there was an interesting uh, commentary around Oracle's uh, talking smack about NoSQL when, uh, in fact, you know, NoSQL is... It, the developers ultimately determine what they want to use. So Oracle can say all the naughty things they want to about uh, NoSQL, but it's being adopted left and right. So the first thing that we wanted to do is look to see who's the leader in NoSQL. So if unstructured data is going to grow like crazy, well, NoSQL is one way to play that. And we're interested to know, all right, who's the leader? Well, the based on the research that we did looking all over reading tons of articles and research papers and whatnot the leader seems to be this firm called mongodb and one source said they have somewhere around a 46 percent market share though they use a automated method of, of gathering that information so we're really unable to find um actual market share numbers and what we usually do is go to gartner's quadrant to see who's the leaders. And this was really interesting. So this is December, 2021, Gartner Magic Quadrant for cloud-based data management platforms. And you can see all the usual suspects in the upper right, but nowhere here do you see MongoDB. And we read through the report and came across this paragraph. It says, uh, regarding MongoDB, its market performance is outstanding and it has been one of the most successful vendors in moving to the cloud. However, they didn't respond to requests to participate for five years running. As a result, they haven't assessed them in this quadrant. In other words, uh, MongoDB doesn't want to waste their time talking to uh, a bunch of people at Gardner to try to position themselves in this quadrant. They just choose to execute instead of uh, even getting involved. It's quite interesting. I think that may be um, well, the first time we've come across a major vendor that um, hasn't been found in a quadrant and also they're suspiciously absent too from Forrester. And in general, 
um, they keep to themselves. So um, in looking at how they compare to other firms, we came across a really good two-part series on VentureBeat that describes three of the hottest data companies to watch today. And they're Snowflake, Databricks, and MongoDB. So earlier, I think I might have said Data Robot. Uh, Databricks is uh, the, the data lake house firm that I wanted to talk about. I'll put a link to our article, as I said. And Snowflake, we recently covered. Um, we'd invest in Snowflake at the right price. The problem is that it never gets to that price, and that's fair enough. But Snowflake has been quite overvalued because it has a lot of potential. And Databricks and MongoDB, this uh, two-part series, describes how these firms interact and in that right now they're not stepping on each other's toes because they're all doing something quite unique, but eventually they will. And they're all growing like mad and they're all interesting firms to look at. So um, the reason that we've been uh, dabbling in this space is that we want more exposure to big data for trends like real-time data. So a way to play that would be Confluent, or uh, and these trends are from IDC, or the uh, storage media type that's growing uh, like mad, and you see Flash there, and that would be pure storage. That's a way to play that. So we've come up with these big data themes and ways to play them. Um, the first two we talked about, then you have data centers. Well, NVIDIA has 43% of the revenues from data center hardware. That's one way to play data centers. Then you have data center REITs. We talked about those. We don't find them compelling. I'll put a link to that piece. Data warehouse technology is outdated. So you have Snowflake coming in with a modern data warehouse with a lower total cost of ownership. They're doing some very cool stuff. And now we're looking at data moving from structured to unstructured, and that's what we talked about today. So when we look at these two firms, Snowflake and MongoDB, both are fairly overpriced. The table on the right here, that's something we produced, I think, a month ago or something like that from our uh, tech stock catalog, and it just shows our nanalyzed valuation ratio, which is simply market cap divided by annualized revenues, keep it simple, and that's the ratio for various firms. Snowflake is always expensive, and we'd probably buy it at a valuation ratio of 20. Then you've got MongoDB, they're still expensive, but uh, let's say according to this ratio, they have a more fair valuation than Snowflake. So I think the next thing to do probably is to really dig into MongoDB to see what they're up to, to look at some of their SaaS metrics, to look at their business model, and that's what we're gonna do next. Now, to conclude, technologies like NoSQL, uh, are growing because of the rapid growth of unstructured data, which means they don't necessarily threaten traditional database vendors as they're creating their own blue ocean total addressable market. Uh, unstructured data growth, as we said, driven by other tech trends such as IoT sensors and uh, mobile phones actually are a big component of unstructured data. And there's really more than enough room for multiple winners when it comes to investing in the big data thesis. So that's where we'd like to get some more exposure to, and that's the purpose of this video. And we'll next we'll dig into uh, looking at uh, MongoDB in a greater depth. So please put your comments in the comment section. Make sure to subscribe to our channel. Share our, our videos, please, with uh, your friends and family. And thanks so much for taking the time to watch this presentation today.